welcome to today's webinar, which is 10 predictions for 2021. What a year 2020 was. Um, and I think it's quite interesting to say that while uh, the past year has been going on and we've been all down in the trenches, quite significant changes have happened. And there's been, uh, in some ways, a rapid acceleration of some of the trends we've been, uh, we've been looking at. So uh, Martin, I think, uh, sort of a, a good time to introduce you as our uh, guest speaker for this. Uh, this is now your, I think, your seventh annual predictions uh, webinar. I think this yes. is probably going to be the one of the most fascinating ones. Well, certainly, uh, we're not looking for change any longer, which was sometimes the case year on year. We're going to go, gosh, did anything really move? Uh, and I, I think that's been mainly characterised over the years by a status quo. It's been very difficult. Uh, there have been popular topics because I know everyone's very keen, but there hasn't been the necessary motivation either by customers or by the brands to invest and change. But this year is just resplendent with, with change all over um, and an incredible momentum that's, that's still blowing through all of that. So there can't be anybody in our audience today that hasn't experienced you know, that kind of momentum and, and some of the opportunities that come from it, but also some of the challenges. You know. Indeed. Well, I'd like everyone to log into the chat room. Some big advantages being logged into the chat room. Only about 40% of your audience are currently logged into the chat room. So it's your, your forum for a back channel. You can ask questions to Martin through the chat room. You can talk with other members of the audience. I know everyone's craving interaction with each other and the chat room is really the, the place to be able to do that. Uh, you have to dial into a different link. Probably this one is the easiest, but just type cch.chat into a new browser window, put in your first name and your email and in you go. Once you're into the chat room, uh, it will look something like this. You can type your messages in here. Uh, up here, you can uh, download Martin's uh, slides. There's a lot of detail uh, on Martin's slides, lots of uh, charts and statistics that you might, uh, might be very useful. And uh, also, we're going to have a quiz later. And here are the voting buttons for the quiz, the ABCD buttons. So if you'd like to log into the chat room, here's the details cch.chat, uh, or if you have difficulty getting in there, if you just type in callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat and you can uh, log into there. We've got about 60 people logged into the uh, chat room, about half the current uh, current audience. So I would encourage you to, uh, to, to go in on that link. It is uh, unfortunate at this stage in a separate window, we are in working through the plans to integrate it in so we can live stream the video feed into the chat room, uh, but that's probably uh, a, a, a little way off yet. Uh, if you want to get a replay and copies of the slides after the webinar, call centhelper.com forward slash recorded dash webinars, and uh, you, can get, uh, you can get a recording, which I know a, like, a lot of you do like to share with your management and leadership teams. Uh, so it's quite, uh, quite, good to be able to, uh, uh, quite good to be able to deal with that. Uh, deal with it with that there. So uh, one of the other advantages being in the chat room is there is a bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates for the uh, for the for the best uh, tip or the best prediction that you have. So if you just like to use hashtag question for a question, hashtag prediction for prediction, or hashtag tip for a tip, and we'll uh, be drawing that at the end of today's at the end of today's session. So I'm just going to start off with a, a bit of a, a warm-up poll. And uh, what do you expect will happen to your contact volumes in 2021, this year coming up? Do you expect them to be higher than they, uh, uh, much higher? Do you expect them to be higher? Do you expect them to be about the same? Do you, under, do you expect them to be somewhat lower? Or do you expect them to be much lower? What do you think is going to happen to... Uh, contact volumes. If you'd just like to uh, vote on that now, I think it's going to be uh, fascinating to see. Martin, your, your prediction for this? Uh, I think it's going to be more on the growth side than the reduction side. The degree, I think, matters is based on sector. Okay, well, let's have a look at the, uh, look, let's have a look at the results. And you are absolutely right. Uh, the, there's definitely a skew here. Um, 
uh, which is skewed towards the higher end. 42% think it's going to be higher, 16% much higher, 28% uh, 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 about the same, and relatively only 14% think, think the, the actual volumes will, volumes will decline. Do you think this, Martin, is to do with people craving human contact, and, or do you think it's just broken self-service? I think there's a bunch of things. I think that um, there are more genuine unexpected issues. Uh, living remotely causes us more problems. We've got more reasons to talk. I think it's easier with some of the non-voice channels to get in touch. Um, and uh, also the degree to which we're successfully implementing self-serve and proactive is still a little bit further out in the future. So a lot of that expectation is still coming across as live. So for those reasons, I think it's growing. Excellent. Well, probably a good chance then to, for uh, Martin for you to share with us some of your some of your predictions for the, uh, uh, yep. for, the for the future. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Uh, right. So let's just get into this. Just press share screen. Yeah. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Sorry, my mistake. There we go. That's the one I want. No, let me start that again. I made a mess of that. While you're doing that, just a reminder, if anyone has just joined us, uh, we're carrying on the discussion in the chat room. Uh, the easiest way to join is type in callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat, or even easier is just type cch.chat into a new browser window, cch.chat, and uh, you can carry on the discussion there. There we go, got myself together. There we are. Right, so we've got a number of topics and areas uh, to talk about. Um, and I think we've co covered probably most of the significant things that are going on. Um, but this one really is the first one, and, it, and it's, a, it's a sort of ground zero point, really, which is why is all this change taking place? You know, and the simple answer is we're in, a, we're in a, um, a pandemic that is causing us to change the way that we live life. And as a result of that, we are adapting our behaviors, both as customers you know, and also as brands. And that's a never ending chase. Uh, and as we speak right now, we're in yet another um, you know, lockdown phase, uh, a much more dangerous, difficult one. Um, and certainly if I'm just gonna take a UK perspective, I know we've got a much broader geographic audience today. Uh, fact is we've got an open-ended um, answer in terms of when it's going to get better. Uh, we've vaguely said Easter, but we could well extend beyond that point. And meanwhile, there's a massive charge in terms of vaccination and the rest of it. And again, depending where you're sitting in the world, some of you will have a slightly faster or slower approach nationally to that particular opportunity to resume normal life. So meanwhile, you know, every time we get a new phase, we're transferring more and more customer engagement online and those habits are getting, you know, deeper and deeper. Uh, and again, it has been said lots and lots, but it is worth just again reiterating the point that that has really caused um, you know, a catalytic leap and acceleration. So here's just some of the stats that bear testimony to that. The first is obviously if I can't go to the shops and I can't do the things that I normally do, I'm clearly going to do that stuff online. Um, and again, the rise in e-commerce has been quite uh, staggering. And that's, you know, within a very short space of time. And that was um, in the middle of last year where those numbers have gone to since that point, they can have only continued to have grown and developed. As a result of that, and on the back of that, the way in which we engage with organizations online, particularly when we're in an e-commerce context, has been increasingly to use what we, much of, you know, what we call digital and whatever you want to put into that bag, but all our interactions are increasingly so. Um, and again, depending upon your geography uh, and the lens that you're using to look at these numbers, it's pretty universal, in fact, that there has been this leap again from uh, a gentle pace of development to a hugely accelerated one. And interestingly, whilst there is still some degree uh, to which this is geographically, or um, no, generationally orientated, the gap between the youngest and the oldest has certainly been truncated um, because everybody has had to survive to some degree or another. So real acceleration on, on digital, uh, and again, if you want to see that in slightly more detail in the context of, of service, then again, an interesting uh, US-based study, you know, have, has your perspective on this situation changed with regard to using different ways of getting customer support? And interestingly, a third of people are saying, yep, I'm up for using all this new way of engaging, um, you know, chat messaging, email, chat box and stuff for everything. 
Now that is weighted slightly towards the younger cohorts, but we've still got fit another 50% saying, well, for some things, absolutely. So we've got a change of mindset. And this is very, very important because again, in previous years, certainly from a UK perspective, we've had a fairly strong reluctance to change. Uh, there hasn't been enough interest. There hasn't been enough motivation. We're clearly in a different world now and people have responded very quickly as a result of that. And there's many anecdotal stories of actually people going, oh, it's actually quite good. Oh, I've enjoyed it. Oh, I never knew I could do that. Um, um, I, I had a comment recently from a piece of research I was looking at, which said, oh, actually not having physical cash and doing it digitally via card. That's good. Never tried that before. So we also see brands waking up and this happens to be Vodafone. But it's a story that we're all to some degree or another going to be mirroring, working from essentially a voice centric, manual, klutzy, expensive way of processing uh, customer needs increasingly to one which is going to be automated, is going to be smart, it's going to have AI right in the middle of it in terms of pushing the dial from reactive to proactive um, and probably mobile first. Huge acknowledgement to the fact that obviously, if you think about it, being at home, the, you know, the, the interface du jour has very much been the smartphone. So again, we're very strongly into an online and also a mobile first world. So we're reimagining, uh, and that's not a hyperbole any longer, which is interesting. We're actually doing it, and it's not just the people we typically said were the disruptors. The interesting point is the market as a whole is in transit. So with that being said, and that's quite a statement relative to other years, uh, let's just have a quick pause uh, and see how that plays out in terms of your own experience. Dante, you're on mute. Uh, the question is, what percentage of your contact volumes are currently through digital channels? That's, for instance, email, web chat, messaging and social. Uh, is it between 0 and 9%, 20 to 24%, 25 to 49%, 50 to 74% or 75 to 100%? Just so I'd just like to, uh, if you could just share in the poll what percentage of contact volumes are currently through digital channels let's just i think we've got most of the results in there let's just uh, share the uh, share the results here and the answer the most common one is between 20 uh, between 10 and 24 percent but quite a, a wide range there interesting eight percent of the audience martin are, are, are predominantly digital yes in, well, in again, I think you'll find that if you look to the brands that were born digital or online primarily, then that's the way they've begun and that's the way they're going to continue uh, at the end of the day. But if you add up those two, you know, the uh, 10 up to 49 percent, um, you've got you've got over half of the audience saying that, you know, we've got significant volumes coming through. Um, I think generally if voice has been part of your mix. It's still around about 60 percent. And one of the interesting points is voice. Um, isn't actually entirely disappearing. It is for some, but it's also staying quite strong for others at the, uh, at the same time. So we're actually looking at a, at a growth of complexity and options rather than necessarily a, tra a straight transition. That's a sort of a, a general overall point to be made, but interesting feedback from folk. Okay, so um, onwards and upwards with that uh, insight from you. Um, Underlying that is, is an obvious statement, which is that, you know, our engagement habits are changing. Now, again, if you look at that from the perspective of you wanting to invest, you wanting to experiment, you wanting to change the way in which you're doing it, there has never been a better time right now than doing it because we've got a large percentage of customers who are up for different ways of, of engagement. We've all been taken out of our comfort zone. Therefore, we are prepared to experiment. With that goes the caveat, it's got to work. And by the way, we'll look at that in a second. But habits are changing. It's a great time to capitalize on that. So just reflecting back on the poll that we've just done, uh, it is a mixed uh, thing. It depends by sector. Some people have experienced less. Some people you know, have experienced more uh, volume as a result of that. And before we started this session, we suggested that might be a, a combination of, of reasons. Um, but Again, there's probably a lot of us that are experiencing more. And certainly from Zendesk's perspective, where they've aggregated, I think it's almost two and a half billion um, you know, interactions they have globally up in the cloud. It might be much more than that. Um, but anyway, from their perspective, they've seen a distinct growth 
in terms of the numbers of tickets that have been issued through um, you know, their particular customer base. So again, it's not surprising that we're under the cosh. Now that's combined with the fact that we've lost capacity, we've been working at home, you know, voice channels have often got swamped at the same time. This is one of the reasons that I think people are also saying uh, at the beginning of the, of the conversation that we're under severe stress in terms of the human element here, in terms of how hard this is. So uh, again, another indicator that people are up for it. Do you feel that the pandemic and any associated restrictions have changed the way you interact? Um, we've got half the audience, and again, this is a, a, a North American perspective saying yes, but of equal importance to me is how well has that worked? And we have a significant number of people that are saying no, it has not worked as well. So to really push hard on this point, we've got to do two things very well. At speed, that's the agile part, but also to standard and to quality. Now that probably means that you've got to iterate, keep focused, improve very, very quickly, and get these new channels up to a point where they're satisfactory from the customer's point of view. I'll talk about the impact on customer experience in a second. Um, it's a big challenge. It's got to be done rapidly with great concentration, but people are experiencing new ways in which they can engage with you, and they are expecting that too. Um, here's a piece of work which was done in the second quarter of last week, last year. Bruce Temkin over at uh, uh, Qualtrics and his Experience Management Institute. And the other way to look at contact mix, of course, is in relationship to what you want to do. Uh, and I'm a big fan of this. It's either literally what was convenient in the moment. The slightly more detailed analysis says it depends on the journey that you're undertaking. And again, you can see here quite clearly that depending what I wanted to do with you as an organization depends upon what I'm doing. Uh, and everything's pretty much on offer there from live voice through to chat, self-serve, you know, even uh, meet in person is probably somewhat restricted these days and self-serve, you know, on your computer. But you can again see a considerable spread and change in that. Now, as I, as I said, I think that that needs validating at a regional level, uh, possibly even at a national level, because I think behaviours and expectations are distinct but it still illustrates the point that you need to understand your key service journeys through the lens of what customers most, how customers most want to do it. And by the way, there is no silver bullet. So the first point to be made here is, as I said at the top of the page, choice is expected. Um, by the way, um, we are also open, which is great, self-service because a lot of the live assistance has been overwhelmed. So it's great news to see that yes, people are getting comfortable with that. Um, or, or, you know, they could be in the future, um, providing we can make our bots and our digital voice, uh, you know, menus work much better. So again, we've got an open-minded audience ready to participate in new kinds of ways if we can make those things work. Um, we also see, uh, quite su not unsurprisingly, a rise in ways to get things done which minimise the danger of contact. So here's a, a wonderful example, which I saw sort of top of last year, really, which is doing shopping using augmented reality. Uh, you can go and shop for your earrings without necessarily having to touch them. Uh, and a well-known brand here in the UK, John Lewis, uh, again, unsurprisingly, is leveraging the fact that we're being Zoomed to death and teamed to death. And therefore, we got quite familiar with, with, uh, with video. Um, and in many respects, the interesting thing is if you have ever been to uh, John Lewis, uh, for others, it's a high-end, um, you know, customer experience touch point in terms of the stores. One of the great joys was going in with the colleagues and the way they interacted with you. <clears throat> it's no surprise that they're using the next best version of face-to-face, -face, which is video, to recreate that. And indeed, the, one of the reasons that maybe we've got more, particularly in e-commerce, flowing through the call center is because we still want some degree of human touch and if we can't get it in store, it's now coming through. And certainly I know from the person that runs the John Lewis site, he said to me at the end of last year that in fact, he's seen an uptick in the volume coming through whilst they've also seen a tremendous growth in online. And his suspicion is that that's because there's still a huge instinct amongst us uh, to still want some form of human contact at the end. In fact, Martin, video is an interesting one because it's a prediction we've been making over, yes. the, over the years. And it, it strikes me that we're all very convenient, very comfortable with video now. We're all having Zoom, uh, Zoom sessions. I have a, a, a Zoom session with uh, with the choir that I'm part yep. of. Um, but it, it strikes me that Zoom hasn't really made it into the. Uh, sorry, that that uh, that video hasn't 
fully made it into the contact center. So we're all using it on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. But when it gets to co contacting a, yes. a company, it's the phone. Do you think that well, I, I, an impetus for change? Yeah, I do. I think it's a late arrival, you know, like the way that we talked about text-based channels, chat, web chat and messaging. Which, how many years did we talk about them? has been obvious and it took a while. Video has been even more niche. But I think we've got over now the idea that we've got a bad hair day. We've got over the idea of how to get online. I think brands where there is, and by the way, it, uh, this is a key thing for me, you use modalities, different modalities based on their strengths and weaknesses. So if you want to fix something, use video because it's easier to see it. You know, it's absolutely obvious as far as that's concerned. Um, if you don't want to be seen, it's a very simple, relatively simple thing. Text has got the convenience. If you want it to be at your convenience, asynchronous is even better. You know, it lends itself when you start to think about the relative strengths and weaknesses of each channel. So I think video in a contactless world makes a great deal of sense for human connection, for seeing stuff. And actually, uh, there are quite a few websites now. I don't know which ones, but I heard somebody talking about it, are putting webcams in store. So you can physically re-experience the, you know, the store to be able to walk around in kind of a virtual way. So I think video as a medium to see things is incredibly powerful. Uh, and we've all got used to it. Our, our kids are being schooled, you know, with video as well. I can't see but that grow. Um, and indeed, some of the newer platforms have specifically had native video as part of their USP. So I predict in the next couple of years, that's going to grow fast. It'd be interesting if anyone is uh, dabbling or experimenting with video or even thinking of a video, just like to leave us a little uh, message in the chat room, uh, callsendhelp.com forward slash chat would be great to do that. Other form, obviously, in, in modality terms is voice. Um, and, you know, this is uh, slightly earlier than COVID, but it does get convenient that I don't have to get out of my protective car to get my payment done. Uh, you know, I don't have to go down. I was talking to some Spanish customers recently and you know very much a physical face-to-face -face culture going in branch massive change since covid and they're now learning how to pay bills and things like that you know in a digital way and again voice has been incredibly powerful as far as that's concerned so again voice uh, contactless is growing and let's not forget this uh, voice remains strong now for some people it has disappeared in lieu of digital growth in text but for some, voice has remained absolutely strong, particularly when it's been emotive, particularly when it's been complex. Uh, and an interesting point made by uh, a piece of research by Netcall says, you know, 41% of UK consumers say that phoning call centers has replaced face-to-face -face and in-store interactions. Now, either that's instinctive, the, the, wanting the sense of a live person, or simply that's easier still to explain stuff, it remains to be seen. And on the right-hand side of the page, you know, a very important stat here, which is a very strong belief system we have that young people don't want to use voice is certainly in the context of that particular piece of research uh, being challenged uh, and that everybody has found need to talk to other human beings. So maybe there's a reverse trend, trend going on there, which is an interesting one and one worth watching quite carefully. Um, other I've thing got, has to be said. I've got a couple, uh, couple of comments back, Martin, about yes. uh, video. <laughs> Uh, Jules yes. said uh, we, we're using video in Welsh water for customers to report water leaks. Interesting. Um, interestingly enough, I had a video consultation for a boiler that needed to be replaced so that they didn't have to come into the house. Uh, Rene says we're uh, experimenting with video in branches and then we're going to roll it out uh, later. And Adam said we've got, we will have video shortly. So it looks like a number of people are, are starting yes. to get down that curve. I think sector specific, it's going to make absolute sense and get standardized quickly across the, within those sectors. Yes, I think that's going to happen. Here's the other one. Again, de again, depending which part of the world you're in, it's either no news or, or growing news messaging. It's been knocking on the door forever. We're a bit slow in the UK, but it's, it's absolutely convenient. And the key point, I think, that's given it special uh, attention at this point has been the fact that it's asynchronous. So since many organizations are physically overwhelmed, being able to spread the load from a workforce management perspective through asynchronous uh, and actually tackle a number of customers at the same time. The customers have the benefit of the fact they don't have to hang around. It's proven to be a real win-win. And obviously we've been much more mobile first during lockdown. So again, it fits very nicely into that particular context. So again, that's something that will continue, I'm sure, to grow. Um, there we go. Right, now let's talk about something I mentioned just earlier about customer experience and its significance uh, during this period of time. 
And I wanted to call out uh, and connect that point about customer experience in the context of what I've been talking about on channel mix. Uh, now, you know, an easy way to talk about this is simply to say, yeah, omnichannel is growing. And certainly the Bruce Temkin work suggests that we expect to have choice as a result of what I want to do with you as a brand. It does not follow though, that using many, many uh, 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 channels in the process of getting my outcome is something that I welcome as a customer. So make sure when you do your analysis of uptake that within journey, you might want to be more suspicious about the number of times people have had to change um, channel because that might not be a, a sign of success and the customer necessarily having a great time. And here's an interesting piece of research that says one of them, the major reason that I'm swapping channels is not because I'm, oh, what shall I do now to entertain myself? It's because I cannot complete things and I'm being forced by a result of the process. So coming into the context of customer experience and service design, we have still got too many instances where we have not adequately thought through how a particular request is expedited and completed through the chosen channel of choice. And we're expecting customers to flip-flop around in order to do that. Now, does that matter? Yes. And you can quite clearly see from the analysis there that as customers, we, we, we don't like that. We resent that, you know, and, and we have a problem with it. Um, and just to put that into a story that I experienced as it happens this morning, <laughs> Um, I unfortunately, having just moved house, didn't really look very carefully as I exited at a, on a gloomy January morning and I slightly bumped somebody, which is a real drag. And then we had to, you know, do the insurance. And I did that finally today, having talked to the person concerned, et cetera, et cetera. And I downloaded the app. I was waiting for my validated password that took too long to turn up. So I noticed the on site, the, the chat option. And I started doing that, had a jolly nice conversation only to be told, of course, that I couldn't complete that over chat. Unfortunately, I then have to make the following phone call. Uh, and by the way, just, <laughs> just to you know, really raise the temperature there, um, I also found that having gotten through to the uh, underwriter and got three quarters of the way through the call, the call was then terminated unexpectedly through a call signal. And so by lunchtime, I was left in huge frustration. So I don't think that we should ignore the fact that underneath this option that customers are going through of embracing new ways of engaging, we have still got to work very, very hard on intelligently using those channels and indeed remembering what we're focusing upon, which is to make things easy uh, and direct as far as the customer is concerned. And if you want any further proof to this, it is interesting that if you look to how channels are used both at the beginning and at the end of calls. It's things like phone and email still, i.e. live, that are being used to get resolution at the end of a journey, uh, at the end of the day. So if you're trying to actually get rid of some of the volume around of live voice, one of the places to go fix is to make sure that the journeys you are offering on alternative channels have really been orchestrated well and they work first time at the end of the day. It's fascinating on that well. graph there to look at the, the difference between the start and the end point. You know, only 24% started on the phone, but 35% ended, ended there. No, and we all go back to a familiar way of doing it in spite of the fact that you're advertising other ways of doing it. And so what, what's it, fascinating there as well, look at online chat. 20% started there, but only 11% ended. So it, it strikes me that phone's doing something that online chat can't. Now, it might be that we haven't enabled online chat to do more, or whether it's security or quite what, but that, 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 those two struck me as quite interesting. Well, and again, assuming that there is, in, in this sense, not a great deal of difference between voice and text in terms of clarity of communication, just let's hold that as an idea, then obviously we haven't lined up our, our workflow as effectively, and it could well be I've got to move you across. It may be suffering from the same problem we've had with social channels. I'm sorry I can't do this via Twitter or via Facebook. You've now got to phone the following number. But it does mean that we've got to keep pace with architecting service journeys. And by the way, there's an obvious point here. Go and do what the customer does, experience those journeys, find out what it's like, find out where those holes are in it, and engineer them out. And I do think, by the way, in addition to omnichannel, one of the points I would like to make here as a prediction is that we should 
we should start to focus upon recommending a single path to an outcome. Whatever it is, it might be chat, might be a bot, it might be voice, it might be video, whatever it is, but just decide which is the best way for the customer to get that particular journey fixed rather than think omni-channel per se is good. It's not, it's a recipe for more chaotic uh, and more expensive ways of communicating. Uh, and once you've decided on that, really uh, monitor it, improve it, optimize it, promote it, and therefore get success. And certainly if you're going to talk to people like Amazon and Google, that's very much their mindset that they will actively recommend the best way of getting an outcome through a particular channel. So that all being said, um, next thing is, is it more or less important during these times that you, we are well attended to? Absolutely. Uh, and by the way, what are the consequences of failure? Uh, well, it's one or two strikes and you're out. Uh, so again, what we're talking about here is significant particularly, by the way, in the context of this next point I'm going to make, which is that because we've all woken up from our slumber, because we're now trying out new ways of doing it, we're trying new brands, we're not necessarily as habitually loyal, and therefore you are under real risk this year of losing customers who previously would never have considered moving away from you. Uh, you can see that reflected in this particular prediction. We are reallocating money, time and effort towards loyalty. And notice that we in customer service are considered part and parcel of that solution. So again, increasingly important in terms of the impact we have. Therefore, we must deliver positive experiences. And again, this is a great way of looking at this. Um, the things that matter commercially are purchasing more, recommendation efficacy, and by the way, the propensity to forgive and trust. All those things are massively important. But the interesting point is it takes a lot to get customers to that particular place. And again, this is interesting work that there are three components that matter around of its success being the outcome. Uh, and notice, by the way, it requires a high rating, which is basically I experienced, um, you know, the outcome being delivered to me in such a way I feel very positive about it. Therefore, 83% have a propensity to purchase more, 81% a propensity to recommend, etc. And notice the very high bar around of success, equally high bar around of the effort involved to get to that particular outcome. And lastly, notice the emotive component. And whilst that is similar to, it does slightly nudge out all the rest of them. So there's two interesting things to be made here. Number one, uh, interesting piece of uh, automated research done by H, uh, Harvard Business Review. They analyzed over a million calls right at the start of the pandemic, you know, where literally everything was up there in terms of payment holidays, cancellations and everything and everything. And the analysis through the, you know, the, the analysis of the language set said it doubled in terms of the complexity and difficulty of the experience. So that's not good. And the second thing that's also not good, and this is a piece of more local, I think it's uh, UK based, it might be European, from Genesis, says that if, you, uh, if you're looking at the emotive component there, then whilst it works in some respects, we've still got a third who are basically, um, you know, uh, emotively blind to the sensitivities of customers. And I think that the word uh, 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 empathy, which has been used a lot this year, is, is part and parcel of this broader discussion of us having a much better sense of what matters to customers. So at the end of the day, we've got to deliver on these things, otherwise we will suffer in terms of loyalty. Right, so it's a series of important points there. Time to have a little break and move into a different kind of a mode. So John T, if you'd like to take over. Okay, well, we're uh, gonna go and uh, jump into our quiz. And uh, if you're not already logged into the chat room, now's the time to do it. Callcenterhelp.com forward slash chat. Uh, or cch.chat. Uh, we've only got about uh, half the audience logged in, so I'll just give you a minute to, uh, uh, to get going. Uh, in order to vote in the quiz, you need to be in the chat room and you need to press on these buttons, A, B, C, or D. So if you'd just like to uh, log into the chat room, it's cch.chat, just put that into a browser and it uh, should take you in straight away. So uh, while you're doing that, um, so the first question is, true or false, within three years, over half of contact centers predict that contacts will overtake voice contacts. So press the uh, A button if it's true, or B button if it is false. I think uh, we've got some of that. So do you believe uh, that over the next three years, half of contact centers 
digital will overtake voice. So I'd uh, just like to vote on that now. We're just waiting for a few more votes to come through. I think we've uh, got most of you in there, in there now. And uh, yes, 30, uh, 37 have uh, got it right. Uh, yes, according to uh, Call Centre Helper, uh, the report, what contact centres are doing right now, uh, which came out in uh, November, uh, over half of contact centres predict that they will be digital within uh, the majority of contacts with digital uh, in three years' time. Um, the next question, what percentage of contact centres report they will be, they'll, will work with both remote and office working post-COVID? Uh, uh, is it A, 64%, B, 74%, C, 84% or D, 94%. So if you just like to uh, vote on that. What percentage of contact centres report their work with both voice, uh, uh, with, bo with both remote and office working post-COVID? So if you just like to uh, vote on that. The, uh, not everyone got the majority on that one right, but significant did. Um, according to a recent webinar poll, just 7% of contact centres believe they'll return to permanently, uh, uh, permanent home working, and uh, a further 9% uh, think it would be an entirely remote contact centre. So there's some quite, uh, quite interesting findings there. So third question, according to uh, 2020 research, which trend has had the biggest positive impact on contact centres over the last five years? Is it A, cloud, B, digital channels, C, managing customer data, or D, process automation? So uh, a bit more of a tricky one, this one. Which trend do you think has had the biggest positive impact on contact centres over the last five years? So if you just like to select the uh, results and let's have a look. And uh, actually most of you got it right. Uh, digital channels is the highest. Actually, they, they've all had a fairly uh, significant impact, but digital uh, channels uh, actually just overcome managing uh, customer data, which was second in the voting there. And uh, last question, uh, ooh, a lot of people quite tied, a bit of a tiebreaker. Which famous author once said, you cannot predict the future, but you can create it? Was that A, Mark Twain, B, Peter Drucker, C, Sheryl Sandberg, or D, Stephen Covey. So if you just like to uh, vote on that and let's have a look at the answer. It was, oh, actually most people got that wrong. It was not Mark Twain. It was actually Peter Drucker, I think in his uh, uh, management book, book of 1990. It has also been attributed to uh, recently on Facebook, uh, that well-known source to Abraham Lincoln, but it, actually that was, uh, that was actually incorrect. So who's won? Well, uh, the, oh, another quote from Peter Drucker is, management is doing things right and leadership is doing the right things. So the winner is uh, Stefan Ten, who, uh, who raced ahead of, the, uh, haste ahead of the field there. So we're going to arrange, arrange a prize for you, Stefan. So uh, uh, well done on that. Uh, right, let's have a look at what's been going on in the... Uh, in the chat room. And uh, we've got a number of uh, predictions coming through. If I can just uh, share these up on the screen, uh, which is here. And uh, so uh, Tom has said chatbots and mobile chat and that chatbots will be at the forefront of call center training. We've had one in from uh, Joel. Oh, a, a comment, uh, Martin, about your uh, I think was it the the Vodi or Moby? Moby? Yeah, the Vodafone. No, I just said uh, I just said congratulations to Joel on that. Yes, that's right. So uh, it's it's already uh, that prediction has already become true. Uh, Anne has said in our organisation organisation uh, we will always have a mix of voice and digital uh, dealing with sensitive matters, and sometimes people really need to engage with a with a live uh, with a live voice which is good. Uh, Dominic has said, I'm fairly convinced that personal customer advice will increasingly lose its attractiveness. And this will be handled via digital contact centers in the near future. So I guess that is um, a sort of a, a, a pure play self, 
self-serve. I don't know. Martin, were you, are you covering that later on? Uh, not directly. And I, and I think, I think if it's ever going to happen, it's going to take some years of finessing. I'll put it that way around. <laughs> okay. Uh, Scott, in uh, response to the video, says that he expects the percentage of customer contact via video calls will increase in the in the coming year. I think that uh, will increase. Interesting. Another one from Joel. The gig customer experience will scale in Europe beyond the early adopters using platforms to enable customers to service themselves. Uh, Uber and Airbnb show the public is ready for for gig working. So that's an interesting one. Gig working for customer customer service. Is that all about getting the the, 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 the payment system right, do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's two versions of that. You know, uh, customer communities have been long-standing, and that's been a decade old. That came at the same time as social uh, media, and I think that's proved successful as a source of customer expertise. The gig economy uh, has been particularly strong in America. Uh, some of the larger brands, technology particularly, have taken it up. It makes a lot of sense to use customers or ex-employees uh, to be available. We are living in a disrupted uh, furloughed environment with more people coming into market uh, and some of the third party platforms such as Limitless um, are doing a good job in terms of uh, allowing brands to plug into another source of expertise. So yes, I think it will grow. Uh, I think the UK is a little bit behind in terms of perceptions. There was an interesting debate pre-Christmas with uh, some negativity in terms of what people thought it meant. So I think there's still some education to be done certainly over here on it. Okay, let's rattle through three more predictions, then we'll go back to uh, Martin's predictions. Uh, Peter uh, or Petter has said, uh, WhatsApp messages will be the fastest growing digital channel in 2021. I'm not sure how popular WhatsApp is in Europe, uh, but already in our country, uh, it is uh, not so commonly used yet. So I think messaging, uh, quite a good one there. At uh, least says increased use of e-learning tailored to each employer's individual needs. I think certainly when you're remote, that's a very good, very good approach. And Kevin has said the gap between the digital literate and illiterate is widening, creating a swathe of a digital underclass getting a worse service and a worse outcomes. That's certainly the case where uh, people are, who are not able to get through on the phone, I think, will uh, feel increasingly. Uh, increasingly left behind. So Martin, do you want to, to play through the uh, remaining? Uh... Absolutely. Um, do I need to reshare or am I? Yes, you do, yeah. Okay, there we go. So where were we? Um, um, we have got halfway down here. Let's just have a look. Boom, boom, boom. Right, here we are. Automation. That's it. That visible then? Uh, not quite yet, but uh, is that turned up or not? No, if you just press uh, share screen and you have to press share screen no, again. Possibly chosen the wrong one then. Hold on, let's just start that again. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Um, yes, I've just chosen the wrong one. Sorry. Is that clear? Just coming through now. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Sorry, I chose the wrong iteration. Right. Um, talking a little bit about automation, it's just a nod really, um, not going to spend a great deal of time on it, but it's clearly something that matters from cost, it's clearly something that matters uh, from simplification and effort, uh, and it clearly matters as part of the overall evolution and revolution uh, into a digital first future. So again, um, why waste time uh, doing stuff that can be automated is the obvious point. Um, there's tactical stuff, which is changing what we've already got. Um, and I think that has still got great appeal uh, and people are still tidying stuff up on an incremental basis. But there is the broader point that uh, I think strategically minded um, people who are focused upon automation will make. And that is that really should be an end-to-end -end perspective and a, and a transformational perspective if you're gonna extract full value. So again, we're seeing more and more people taking the opportunity as things are changing at the moment to fundamentally say, how do we do this core customer journey and how can we make it totally different? Um, and as such, we're seeing this big move in terms of transforming uh, and automating. Uh, and indeed, sometimes doing that on the basis of that being a, uh, a staging ground then 
for further levels of automation in terms of virtual assistance on top of that. So big things taking place there. Um, the other big thing, and, and again, it's one of the things that I am personally really excited about, and I think is, is, is definitely got other levels of transformational potential sitting in it, is this whole business of using data. Um, and moving from being reactive to predictive and using data in real time. And if you think about it, just to be slightly cynical, that CRM is often something that organizations do to us as customers, collecting our data, and we see very little value to it. And I st think that we're still within our rights to be very cynical about what, you know, customization benefits we really get. I do think that things are now changing. Um, and one of the interesting things about our part of the world is that if you can spot what I want early in a conversation um, without involving human beings and without involving me repeating myself and being transformed, uh, transferred, then we have got massive opportunity. An intent-driven routing, um, particularly pushed out by you know, some of the most powerful uh, exponents of AI and machine learning, such as Google and Amazon, have really done some interesting things. And I know many people in the audience will have vendors who are connected, particularly to Google Cloud, uh, which gives you the opportunity to understand intent, gives you the opportunity to decide whether or not it's routed then to live or assistant uh, service, uh, and then is processed through the uh, correct platform, and as such uh, is transformational in terms of um, it being faster and smarter and less effortful, and is definitely impacting the traditional ways in which we do triage. Again, most of us will have noticed that IVR is, is at last changing for the good, um, and that digital voice there has been used incredibly effectively. Um, Google announced much of that sort of half, you know, about six months ago. Uh, Amazon is still in the middle of its extended uh, introduction of what they're up to. Um, and again, this is pretty sort of hot off the press. But again, you're looking at a, a comparable level of capability. Um, their branding calls it something slightly different. But again, there's two things here which are noteworthy, which is rather than necessarily um, uh, spend a great deal of time and effort around of knowledge management and consolidation, um, thinking more in terms of just making sure that we can go to various repositories in real time and find relevant information about a topic and then proactively push that back to the desktop um, in terms of workflow or knowledge management. And indeed, if that was done in a self-service context, deliver that to the customer, exactly that kind of a benefit. Um, and again, we've got the same kind of opportunity to do that with customer profiles. Everything that I know about you, how does that change my anticipation and prediction about your need in the moment now? And again, I've heard both the head of Google and the head of, and the head of Amazon talk about how they run it within their own organizations. And it's extremely compelling, the ease with which they make it clear what I need and how I can get what I want. And I think they are continuing to lead the way um, and demonstrate that we really are in a different kind of a world. Um, notice at the back end, uh, again, optimizing customer services time, simply because we're able to decipher in real time intent uh, and needs. We can therefore do automated tagging, dispositions. And of course, interestingly, we also end up with an incredibly powerful base of information um, on customers, uh, sorry, on, on what the conversation was, which again is gonna interestingly challenge um, some of the ways in which we do interaction analytics uh, at this particular point in time. Here's just another one, which again is saying in real time, we can just decipher topics, but we can also decipher um, sentiment, trending towards emotion, um, and we can get a good idea therefore about what's taking place. Now for me, that really puts things in a totally different place because it means that we, are in, we know what's going on in real time. Um, we, we've got a real difference between dumb data, which is impossible to deal with, and highly relevant real-time insight, which can be you know, increasingly executed as real-time alerts. And if you consider the context of now working remotely, where it's much more difficult to figure out what's going on, this is an absolute godsend in terms of changing the way that that happens. So exploiting this generation of technology for me is a massive central theme uh, of, any, um, of, of any particular next generation strategy. I hasten to add, I've only given you the Google and Amazon examples. They are certainly not the only ones in town doing it. Um, so go, you know, if you're not already in, in conversation with your particular technology partner, find out what their views are, what they're doing on this, because to my mind, it absolutely needs to be central in terms of what we're trying to do next. 
So that's one thing, and I suppose part and parcel of that is to say how quickly can we capitalize on these new opportunities. Um, and a theme that I just wanted to share with you was, was this. And I was, I was chairing um, sort of towards the end of last year a marketing conference, and Mark Evans came on talking about the journey that they've been through um, from you know, getting online 10 years ago, from having a special group working outside the mainstay of the organization, doing fancy stuff online, finally bringing that sort of disruptor group back into the organization to show what digital actually meant to everybody else until finally the implications of being agile weren't just confined to the IT team, but they suddenly became a, a corporate wide culture. And the point that Mark was reporting on was that the organization in direct line at board level in head office has decided to reorganize in the philosophy you know, of agile, which is cross-functional, you know, losing some of those titles, working in, in just fundamentally different way. And the reason they bought into that approach was just because the world is changing so damn quick, we will not keep up unless we actually fundamentally reorganize. And I think many of us are going to find ourselves, again, part of a much broader organizational conversation about how we as customer service, and having done a great job, I might add, during the pandemic, keeping the brand safe and keeping customers engaged in a positive way, how do we then collaborate more deeply with other parts of the organization in a way that allows us to maintain that pacing? So keeping up massively important. And then we hit the big topic. Um, I've talked a lot about customers. I haven't talked a lot about us and what it's felt like. You know, I haven't really got a section here about at home uh, and, you know, and all of that kind of good stuff. We're all pretty much locked down doing that. We will be going into a future where it's going to be a mixed one. Different parts of the world seem to be more or less radical on it, but everybody's going to have at least at least 40 percent, you know, sort of um, um, staying at home in some degree. And it's a massive change. And with that comes a huge thing around of the experience of trying to do that. Um, we're on, in unprecedented times in terms of the ask that we have on people in terms of well-being and mental health. And the basic point I want to make here is having done some work pre-Christmas on this with some organizations and having really dipped into the experience that they're having as service organizations is that clearly a lot of people are finding it a real struggle. Um, you know, I'm, I've got young, uh, you know, young people in the family, homeschooling, trying to also do other work at the same time. You know, it's not easy by any stretch of the imagination. And again, one of the key things, obviously, is to take the stress out of the day-to-day -day interaction. But there's a broader point I'd like to make. I think that we have been benefiting from the fact that many people rose to the challenge in March of last year and really did some heroic stuff. Getting, you know, homeworking up and running as fast, looking after people, continuously changing, nobody taking holidays, everyone too scared because it was furlough, all that kind of good stuff. That's been very good up to this point. But you know, we're human, we're not superhuman. And what we've got to recognize is that we must resource ourselves, particularly through this, you know, this next period of time. And if it's going to become permanent, find new ways of coping with it. My basic message here is well-being isn't just a topic. It needs to become a competency. It needs to become something that we get good at, at sharing, good at teaching, good at providing time for, good at tracking, and good at intervening in because we can't simply continue to be superheroes on this particular stuff. Ain't gonna work, there's plenty of evidence, we've reached the end of our tether as far as that's concerned. Um, and although obviously happy people are productive people, a lot of people are on the wrong side of this chemistry that you're looking at here, which is that you know we're, we've run out of goodwill, we've run out of that kind of internal mojo for a lot of us. Uh, and although we don't want to be, it wasn't so, quite so rejuvenating at Christmas, the UK was a poor experience of not being able to link in with friends and family and all of that rejuvenation that happens with family. Uh, and the fact is a lot of people feel pretty sort of low at this, at this point in time. So there was some good work done at the end of last year about, you know, sort of mental health days and stuff. And in terms of introducing themes, you know, the theme of OK to not be OK um, is, is hugely important because it allows you to bring the conversation into the room around of how people feel. Uh, at the end of the day. Now, this is in the context, by the way, of everything I've just said, which is a massive opportunity to reinvent. Many parts of the market are under severe threat, particularly with retail. It's not a time not to be doing to stepping up to the plate. And so it's difficult for people to admit that they feel not just under the weather, 
but fundamentally incapable of doing this stuff. So there's some very important things to do. Number one, just this, this is just one example. Some of the skills around of reframing, uh, around of mental health and management need to become skills that we deliberately spend time teaching people uh, and enabling people. Uh, my partner was looking at Netflix as at yesterday and there's a great thing on mindfulness um, you know, out there at the moment, some good series on that. There's lots of good material. We need to be spreading that. I know a lot of people have got mental health you know, positions and offices and all that kind of good stuff. And it just needs to continue to go right the way down to the front line uh, and to make sure. Now, funnily enough, part of what I learned last year is that whilst there's definitely a strategy around of it, it absolutely begins with leadership behavior. Because if we do not demonstrate that we are prepared to act in a different way, nobody else is going to have the courage to do it. Uh, and in a global organization, which is the work that I was doing, email is a very interesting thing in a 24-7 culture. Email is the thing that interferes you when you need to take time off, when you need to rest, gets you not to have a good weekend and all the rest of it. So how are you going to put boundaries between work and life and reassert the balance? And the quick answer to that is that you need to demonstrate leadership if you are in charge because others will follow. You. And if you don't do it, nobody else is going to have the guts to do it. So there's a very, very important conversation at the moment because all businesses are onwards and upwards. What is the balance between the stuff on the left hand side and the stuff on the right hand side? And it begins with spending time, not just as a tick box exercise, but being prepared to demonstrate personal vulnerability, being prepared to encourage others to talk about it and to get used to talking about it and then to start to learning new ways of coping. Because unless we do that, all the good stuff we're trying to do, they're going to suddenly find it stops because nobody is left able to do that work. So really, probably the thing that underpins everything I've said today is we've got to take, take a step back if we're not already doing it, recognize that what we did on mental health and well-being needs a new chapter and a much deeper investment characterized by the fact that it needs to be a competency and skill at the organizational level, but also in individuals. And we need to create a climate and culture where there is permission for that. All right, end of that soapbox. And I think it's the end of what I need to say. Wonderful. Well, we'll uh, uh, be fascinated to know which one of Martin's predictions uh, resonated most with you, or which one did you like best? So. Was it the lockdown transfers more customer engagement online? Was it customer engagement habits are changing? Was it the customer experience matters even more in the current climate? Was that automation keeps on growing? Is it predictive and real time becomes key? Is it reorganizing to adapt faster? Is it the section on uh, mental health and uh, well-being? I like some of the sections in there. Or is it leaders setting the right example? So just like to uh, share on that. Martin, uh, uh, absolute wonderful uh, presentation there. I think uh, lots of uh, lots of uh, 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 food for thought, and really quite an acceleration of uh, of some of the, the the trends we went through at the beginning of uh, at the beginning of uh, beginning of last year. So let's have a look at the uh, uh, the section that uh, that uh, uh, had the the highest uh, take up was the customer experience matters even more. Uh, is the section there that, uh, that really uh, resonated most, followed by uh, customer engagement habits are changing as a result of the, of the pandemic, and uh, followed by uh, leaders setting the right example, particularly uh, uh, regards to uh, mental health. So thank you very much for that, Martin. We're just going to pick up a couple of, uh, couple of tips and uh, questions from the, uh, from the chat room. Uh, Patty says, it's funny how customer service leaders have been screaming for omni-channel options for a long time, and, but it's taken a year like 2020 to get the uh, executives on board. Uh, Will has said there have also been, uh, am I sharing screen okay there? No, uh, you're not. Okay, so that wouldn't make a lot of sense. Let's see if I can uh, just share this here. So hopefully everyone in the audience can uh, can see that. Uh, Will has said there's also fr uh, frustrations with AI and virtual receptionists due to the customer getting the sense that they are unimportant enough for a real person instead of uh, an ever loop looping telephone tree. I thought that's that's quite an interesting uh, observation. If you're not important enough to speak to a, a human, what sort of message does that send out? 
Um, Angela says, I worked for a company about five years and we had started to use video for technical issues at that point. Uh, it was fabulous where someone with something was too technical for first line advice to go through. So it's passed to a technician team to arrange for suitable time or day for video help. I think it's a great one. Let's just pick up on a, a couple of uh, uh, quick product, uh, predictions. Um, Russell says that Signal will become the fastest growing digital channel in 2021. Hmm. cannibalizing users from yeah. whatsapp i've not heard of signal before so i'm uh, that's my homework for uh, for this afternoon so thank you for sending that in russell uh joel has said uh, mental health i think it ties in with your your point will become a relevant kpi for call centers disparate workforce yes. given mental health well-being as a driver of satisfaction it's been woefully ignored for too long so that's uh, i think tying back into the the leadership bit and let's pick up, uh, Mike says, simply service across all channels will be a great, greater differentiator than ever. So unfortunately, we've reached the uh, top of the hour. If in the chat room, you could say, what did you like best uh, about today's webinar? The winning tip or prediction comes from Scott, who says customer expectations have changed throughout 2020 due to the pandemic and delays have been largely accommodated. In 2021, customer patience is now wearing thin, and we'll see a large increase in dissatisfaction and complaints for companies who don't get things uh, right first time and efficiently. Uh, I think that ties in, Martin, very much with your uh, uh, with one of the, the comments you made about people are now experimenting with different. Uh, uh, different companies and different ways of working. Can I just say one last thing? I think every, last year we just ran at it. This year we've also got to prioritize because we'll get too exhausted. So, you know, I, I, I'm a very st strong fan of strategy. I don't know that it's necessarily done a lot, but this year deciding what matters most and how it's all going to get together, absolutely vital. Otherwise, I think you're going to fall over. Brilliant. If you can complete the survey on your way out, it's only three questions long. Uh, the replay will be available in about an hour's time and we'll be back next week looking at uh, surpassing industry standards of metrics. So just like to say, uh, Martin, thank you very much for uh, joining us again today. We Brilliant. hope to welcome you back, uh, welcome you back, well, potentially before next year, but certainly welcome you back for the prediction section uh, next January and we can see, uh, see what an impact uh, this accelerating world has had. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to everyone in the audience. We look forward to joining you uh, this time next week. Thank you then. Bye-bye.